Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. So our next speaker is uh, Borda Kok, who is an assistant professor of uh, cryptology at NTNU, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He has an MSc degree in computer science and engineering uh, from the Eindhoven University of Technology, where he focused on information security, and a PhD on post-quantum key exchange protocols from NTNU. In his research, Bohr mostly works with on key exchange and password-based protocols, where he teaches courses about cryptology and network security for master students. Sorry, sure. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I'm also going to talk about symmetric uh, encryption, but I'm, I'm going to go more towards the technical side. And um, I think in, in the title of my presentation, I already kind of answered the question that Manon just asked. I think that these protocols are very suitable, for instance, uh, for IoT-based systems. Um, but yeah, first to talk about myself, this is what I look like. Um, I am uh, just like Complimatica, 100% Dutch. I was born and raised in uh, Dordrecht, did my uh, master's in Eindhoven, and uh, somehow ended up in Norway where I still am. And my research interests normally are uh, post-quantum cryptography, key exchange, passwords, authentication, etc. I want to say that I, I see myself mostly as a, as a lattice crypto person, uh, but since there was so much lattice on the program, I thought this was a very interesting topic to address. Um, I realized that seeing this on the program also um, caused some people to have questions, which I thought I'd, I'd address first. Um, so first of all, Trondheim, it's uh, here on the map. Um, the second question, Yes, we already had snow this year. And, and uh, the third question is, yes, we do still have some sunlight all winter, but not a lot. Um, so I work for NTNU. Um, I assume most people have not heard of it, but we are uh, the largest university in Norway um, with campuses in Trondheim, Jövik, and Ålesund. And we have around 43,000 students across three cities. And we are a crypto group of around 30 people. Eight, uh, eight faculty and a group of PhD students and postdocs. And this picture is not from last week, but from February. So when we are talking about key exchange, I think um, it's, it's important to, to yeah, realize that, of course, we are working on post-quantum key exchange. And the most obvious thing to do is to translate the protocols that we have to a post-quantum setting by replacing uh, the primitive that we base them on to something that cannot be broken on the quantum computer. Um, but what we see already is that even though there are good and efficient algorithms out there, if we compare them to the state of the art right now with pre-quantum crypto, we do, uh, we do have to, to, to move to algorithms that are a lot more inefficient. And symmetric algorithms such as AES are effectively post-quantum. They are very efficient also. But with those, we lack many of the security features that we really like in the current algorithms we have. So if you move from a key exchange algorithm to symmetric crypto, you would, you would lose things like forward secrecy, um, which is something that we, that we really want to have. So what we want to achieve in, uh, I want to say, the IoT world is we want to make something that resembles authenticated key exchange for devices that are very constrained. So we are really in this work focusing on IoT, on devices that you can put out there uh, that run on a battery that have a very limited capacity when it comes to calculation and when it comes to sending messages. We focus on a setting where we have pre-shared symmetric keys, so you can preload your devices with something, and we do want to get those uh, things like forward security. Um, and we want something that's called synchronization. So we want to be able, even though we are achieving forward, forward security and changing keys, we want to be sure that the keys that we have across devices are synchronized and that they always are the same on both sides. We also want to achieve something called concurrent correctness, which I'll get into later. 
Uh, and in this talk, I'll uh, mostly refer to a paper that we've written a few years ago in which we show how you can do this. And this is joint work with my co-authors, Colin Boyd, Garrett Davies, Kai Geller, Tibor Jager, and Lisa Milieu. And what we do in this work is we show that there are three uh, very efficient what we call authenticated key exchange protocols with linear key evolution. So by evolving the key, we can achieve these, uh, these uh, properties. And we have two properties where we do the same. Uh, we have two protocols where we do a similar thing, but with keys that do not evolve linearly. So they evolve in a different way. To make this possible, we define a new framework because these kind of protocols don't really exist. So we have to define the model ourselves. And uh, we show that we can formalize these properties and then we can prove that they are in fact achieved by the protocols that we provide. So first about authenticated key exchange. So authenticated key exchange is a setting where I have two people, Alice and Bob, and Alice and Bob want to exchange a key, key AB, that they can use to talk to each other. And the authentication part means that Alice, after going through this protocol, is quite sure that she's really talking to Bob, and Bob is quite sure that she, he's talking to Alice. From these, uh, this key, we derive then a session key, and the session key is what they use to talk to each other. Now, forward security is a property that we really like. Um, forward security means that, okay, say Alice and Bob have this, uh, this uh, shared master key, key AB, they derive a session key, they talk to each other, they talk to each other a second time, and then they have a new session key, S2. And then an adversary comes into play, and the adversary somehow manages to compromise Alice's system and manages to, uh, to steal this key AB. And using this, uh, the latest session key that we have can be derived. Now, the idea of forward security is that using this new session key, the adversary is not able to derive the earlier session keys. So we want to have a situation where uh, compromising the system now does not mean that you can read every message that we've sent to each other beforehand. And this sounds kind of obvious, but it's really not. And especially when you say symmetric keys, many people immediately think, okay, symmetric keys are always the same, and that means that everything's encrypted with the same key always, which, again, in the protocols that we're presenting is not the case. So when we want to achieve forward security with symmetric keys, what we need to do is evolving the keys. So we need to make sure that uh, at a certain step, that is a step in time or, or a certain uh, occurrence of an event, we evolve the keys to a new key that is then used. And there has been some work on time-based evolution, um, but triggered evolution where you say every time that you derive a new session key is maybe more relevant and more interesting for us because we want that every new session starts with a new session key and that the key material before that is, is effectively discarded. And there are some challenges with this. So when we speak of these evolving keys, we need both parties to actually do the same number of steps because we need them to have the same key. If they somehow get out of sync, and again, think of an IoT device, maybe uh, a sensor somewhere in the forest, uh, if this is out of sync and you cannot reach it anymore, how can you fix this? It, you really can't. So the synchronization is extremely important. Concurrent correctness is another thing. So say that I have various sessions with the same device then somehow this needs to work out in such a way that uh, these sessions don't conflict with each other and that these different uh, attempts at synchronizing and at going to a new key make th that this doesn't cause the keys to be out of sync. And there are some protocols out there that have tried this before us. Uh, they are called SAIC and SAIC EM. And they need a number of messages that we think is very large and they don't actually achieve this uh, synchronization robustness property at all. So we thought we could do this better and that's why we wrote this work. And one of the protocols from our work is called LP2, which is our linear protocol with two messages. And what we do in this linear protocol is okay, so we have these two people or devices, Ellis and Bob, that have a master key to start with and they have a counter. And when we start the protocol, the counter is set to zero. Now, they also have a Mac key, which they use to do the authentication part through message authentication codes. 
So when Alice wants to talk to Bob, what she does is she advances her counter with one step and she sends a message to Bob. And when Bob receives, receives this message, Bob thinks, okay, uh, the Mac is valid. I have a counter that's currently at zero, so I will evolve also, and then I will send the message back to Bob. And after he's done that, he will derive a key for the session from the master key, and he will evolve the current key, master key material that he has. And he increments his counter with one. And when Alice receives a message from Bob, she knows that Bob has done this, so she does the same thing. And now they both have the same session key, and they both have evolved their key material to achieve this. Now, this protocol works also in situations where we, uh, where we complicate things by having uh, counters uh, for various concurrent runs in parallel. So say Alice starts a new run, they're both at counter two, she is, at count she is now at counter three because she's initializing, Bob accepts, and then derives and comes to counter four, but somehow this acceptation message gets lost. Now Alice hasn't uh, incremented, but Bob has. In our protocol, this is not a problem because for the next session, session Alice will start with uh, five and Bob will derive and they will be in sync again. Now, for this linear evolution, we provide three protocols. And this was uh, the one with two messages and uh, we have one with one and one with three as well. The one with one message uh, is essentially a situation where you have, uh, instead of having two devices that do similar things, you have one that kind of plays the leading role and one that follows. So you have one-way authentication and the, the uh, device that follows will just follow the instructions from the first one. The third one is more interesting um, because what we do in this one is uh, we provide key confirmation and we also introduce a new property called the bounded gap. So with these three messages, we can actually prove that no matter what happens, the gap between the counters on both sides will not uh, become larger than the number of concurrent sessions. Uh, and um, this is extremely useful if you want to be sure that uh, these devices that again can be somewhere uh, lost at sea will always be reachable and will always stay in sync. And uh, this also solves in this setting a security property. Because if you think about these as, again, devices that are somewhere running on a battery, then an attack where you uh, force one of them to say uh, evolve from counter five to counter 300 would kill the device because they would do well, 300 steps, they would derive new keys 300 times, they would send messages, which is very expensive if you're running on a battery 300 times, uh, and essentially this would drain the battery and the device would become unreachable. So having a protocol where you can in fact prove that the number of steps that you get out of sync is very limited is uh, super practical in this setting. And we show that for our protocols we achieve this uh, weak synchronization robustness in every case. Um, and the number of messages again is one, two, and three, which is uh, fewer than in the literature up to this point. Now what we would want to achieve is this full synchronization robustness and this concurrent uh, correctness. And to do this, we need to get away from this linear evolution. And this linear evolution of keys is very simple from a technical perspective, because the only thing we do is we just put the previous key into a key derivation function, which I can't really mathematically say this, but it's kind of a complicated hash function, and then we have a new key. But if we want to uh, achieve these properties, we need to move away from linear evolution. And, um, but, but before I go there, let's look at our security model. So the security model is, um, I guess, something you could describe as the framework for protocol analysis. So the security model is how we describe the security of our protocols in the literature, and it kind of sets the standard for the mathematical proofs that we have to deliver to prove that the protocol is secure. And by doing things in similar models, we also are able to compare protocols fairly because we look at them and their security level the same way. Um, we base our model on the AKE model from Bellari and Rogaway from 1994, uh, mostly, but we have to add notions of concurrent correctness and of synchronization which don't exist in the literature. Um, 
which is what we do in our paper, and we also formalize this synchronization robustness, which again is the ability to compute keys in future sessions if something goes wrong. And uh, to, to demonstrate this here, say I have Alice and Bob, um, again, they're at counter zero. Alice initiates a session, goes to counter one. Bob says, okay, I accept. The session continues and completes. Bob is at counter two now. And then, but Alice has already initiated the second session before the message from Bob arrived. Now, what happens now? Um, Bob accepts, no, sorry, Bob has accepted the first one and replied. Alice sees that the reaction to the first message from Bob is in fact valid, but Alice is already at counter three. So she aborts this session, and then as soon as Bob has accepted the second session and reacted with counter three, they're both in sync again. To obtain this in every and all session, uh, in every and all setting, um, we need to uh, we need to change the protocols. So we want to capture, in a sense, in our model, the ability of two parties to succeed in exchanging a session key in the future, no matter what has happened previously. And we say, if the parties get out of sync, we want to re-synchronize. We have two definitions, weak and strong. Weak means the following. Any honestly executed, uninterrupted session will succeed no matter what has happened before. That means that we have concurrent sessions. That means that messages in previous sessions got dropped, got reordered or altered. Somehow messages got not accepted by one of the parties. And this has led to parties getting out of sync. We say that either way, once there is a session that Alice and Bob can do without any interruption, oops, we get in sync again. And we, say, we see that in, in our linear protocol with two messages, this will work, but it won't work anymore if we allow role reversal. So if we allow any of the parties to be the initiator. Full synchronization robustness takes it one step further. Here we say, okay, any honestly executed session will succeed no matter, no matter what else is going on. So there can be concurrent sessions, there can be previous sessions, anything can have happened. Uh, there can be arbitrary many sessions. The adversary might completely mess with the network, might interleave messages, might, might do whatever. Um, but there is one that is completed honestly and that will succeed. Again, impossible with linear protocols. So we have to look at a way to evolve keys that doesn't proceed linearly. And what we make use of here is something called a puncturable pseudorandom function. And um, a pseudorandom function is a function that if you put in some value, it will output something that looks random, but the same input will always give the same output. A puncturable pseudorandom function is a pseudorandom function that has another algorithm. It allows you to puncture at point k in x, such that evaluating on the punctured value fails, puncturing on an already punctured value returns the same key, and puncturing is commutative. And I realize, I see some people that are looking at this like, oh my god, I wasn't, said, I wasn't told there was going to be math, I'm sorry. Um, but if you think of a, of a key as a strip, a strip of values, then puncturing that key essentially means poking out values from the key. And I think that intuition makes it a bit more logical because then you see the same thing. If you try to evolve on the, or, or if you try to evaluate on the function that, um, no. if you try to evaluate on a value that you've punctured, it doesn't work, right? Because there's a hole in the strip. If you puncture on a value that you have already punctured, the same thing, because that, that already happened. And commutativity is also implied, because it doesn't matter if I have my strip, if I first poke a hole here and then I poke a hole there, the result is the same as when I've done it the other way around. And we use this to, um, to now make keys that evolve in different ways than just linearly. What we do here is we determine by evaluating on the session nonce. So the nonce of the session determines where we will evolve from on this puncturable key. Now, 
if we start building protocols using this property, then we can suddenly achieve all of this. So we can even in a protocol that only has one message from A to B, we can achieve this full synchronization robustness and concurrent correctness. And of course also forward security, which was the whole point of this work. The only difference here between the protocol with one message and a protocol with a message in reverse is that we achieve mutual authentication so that both parties are authenticated to each other. And that means that if I zoom out and we compare in the above two lines uh, the literature before we wrote this paper and then the five protocols that we introduce in this paper, uh, you see that we are able to achieve these security protocols and these protocols for uh, usability we, we achieve all these future features while we reduce the number of messages dramatically from what existed in the literature. Um, and again, this really makes it possible to use symmetric cryptography uh, with, for instance, IoT devices or in other settings without uh, yeah, giving away the things that we like in, in key exchange when it comes to forward security. So. What I want to conclude with is, uh, I think it's important to remember, and I guess that was also uh, the takeaway of, from Pascal's talk, um, symmetric cryptography is really relevant. It's very easy for us to kind of equate the post-quantum transition with uh, thinking of how we replace, for instance, Diffie-Hellman with post-quantum Diffie-Hellman, but it, it's not. Symmetric cryptography can really play an interesting role in this transition. And and post-quantum is not just finding new key exchange protocols and finding new signature protocols. I also think, and, and this is in line with what many speakers have said today and yesterday, when we make a post-quantum transition, we shouldn't just look at how we swap out one protocol with another one, but we have to really think about our systems and how we can change our systems to achieve the goals that we want to achieve and not just the protocols with new protocols. And when it comes to our work, uh, it's currently being implemented, but it's not yet. So currently this is theory. And uh, yesterday someone asked me, do you do like software or hardware? And I was like, I do math mostly. Uh, we are working on implementation, but what we, what we see, even though we don't have real world test data yet, we see that the theoretical analysis is promising. And that this is really m way more efficient than, for instance, doing uh, lattices on like a little a little hardware device that's powered by a battery. Like this is this is way more efficient. Um, and if you want to get involved either in this implementation phase or if you think, oh, this is great, I need this in my products or in my uh, in, in in what I'm building, then uh, let me know, let us know, because we're really eager to to talk to you about it. Um, and if you want more info, uh, I really hope that you want to have a look at our paper, uh, look at all the protocols that we have and uh, the math in more detail than just this uh, short run through. Uh, it's open access, so you can find it on ePrint and, uh, and we really welcome comments and interactions. I'm also very happy and excited to talk to all of you. So find me afterwards, send me an email uh, or find me on, on Twitter or LinkedIn, and uh, I'm very uh, happy to discuss uh, this or more traditional key exchange with you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I two quick questions. First of all, how come there's a separate Mac key? Does it have a different key schedule than the... Symmetric key? Uh, yeah, so you need, you need in general to use a different encryption key and a different authentication key, right? That's... that's uh, you can't use an authenticated encryption mode? Um, I, I wouldn't think so because then you couldn't authenticate uh, if you're not yet in sync. So if you're out of sync and waiting to resync, you couldn't authenticate because you would have different encryption keys on both sides. I see, okay. I think that's the answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the other quick question. Uh, so you said it was punctured based on the nonce used for the session. Yes. Um, but that means then if a nonce is reused, you end up with the same uh, key out of it, right? Yeah. So okay. you shouldn't. <laughs> so don't. No, so you nonce. should pick yeah. large okay. enough nonce values. No, we addressed this in the paper actually on the part of on the puncturable encryption. But yeah, the, non the nonce shouldn't repeat 
too often, uh, generally speaking, I think, and right, not here thanks. either. Thanks. Hi, my question is around uh, the, the slide number 16, which has uh, Alice and Bob. Uh, so this sort of a exchange uh, where uh, slide 16, I think. Yeah. Apologies. Oh, here. Yeah. yeah that's perfect. So this counter uh, approach, if you have uh, if you have lots of Alice, which means uh, a centralized system, which is doing a key exchange with the lots of lots of your uh, sensors all yeah. over the place. Uh, on theoretically, and you said this is currently theoretical right now, and that's probably is my question was implementation point of view, really good concept, and I think it will help solve us in a, the problem we're working on right now, is how practical it is to manage that concept for a very large hundreds of thousands of Alice where the stream is happening, and how will you manage the counters for Bob? So Alice, all of the Alice can manage it. How would you manage a centralized counter for that? Yeah, uh, I think that's that's a that's a good question, and that uh, yeah is again an implementation question. But it is, I think the the question is how how complicated does it get? And if you only have a session key and a Mac key and a counter, that's still not a lot of storage. For instance, if you it's not the storage. It's not the I think the storage is probably the easier part. But I think yeah. I probably won't like to draw a diagram for you. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, non-technical, but the technical team probably have lots of answers, yeah. uh, questions, but uh, I think I will probably would catch up your concept on this. Okay. Because you may have something which may be very useful for us. Okay. Well, thanks. <laughs> thanks. A quick question, which is more of a curiosity. The, uh, the, the security proofs, did yes. you do them pen and paper or did you use tools like Tamarin or Proverif? Uh, pen and paper. Pen yeah. and paper. Yeah. No, so we, we use... Um, we use game-based proofs for the security of the protocols. For the, uh, the the discussion of, for instance, the bounded gap, we use state diagrams. So we use a not super conventional proof technique because, uh, yeah, we, we show that the steps you take, what what consequence they ha consequence they have for the gap that you're uh, that you're currently in, and then we sh we show that this is a not an infinite state diagram. Okay. Hmm. But it's uh, yeah d doing this. Um, I believe, actually, that someone at our um, uh, at our department, we had a master student who analyzed this in Tamarin, and I do believe that that work is out there. Okay. But I haven't. I, I don't have a. M maybe we can catch up. And, and Let's talk about it afterwards, yeah. because someone did look at that. Yeah, you're you're right. In yeah. That. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the great talk. My question is about the puncturable PRFs. Yes. Um, I'm not familiar with those, so uh, kind of on the one hand, how complex are they to uh, design and implement? And on the other hand, how much cryptanalysis, security proofs do we have about them? So um, puncturable functions and puncturable encryption is kind of the, the, new, the new cool thing, right? Um, off the top of my head, I'm not aware of an implementation that's like ready to use, but that might be wrong. But there have been a few uh, papers uh, in recent years that analyze them from a from a cryptographic point of view and and from a cryptanalysis point of view. Uh, so uh, Kai Geller, who was one of the co-authors of this paper, has written a lot about them, um, and uh, and I would I would recommend looking at his work if that's something you're interested in. It's uh, yeah, it's a very interesting kind of cool new thing that. Uh, I hope we'll see in many other protocols as well. Thank you. Thanks. We actually had a similar question from uh, online. It's like, how do you build a functional PRF? Like, what are the... Yeah. Oh, how long do you have? No, no, okay, of <laughs> no, course. No. It's really, but can you give us insight, right? How yeah. complex is this comparable, for instance, to like uh, our uh, asymmetric uh, crypto? Or how close is it really to... It's simpler than that, yeah. Um, so again, I don't. Uh, I'm not a. I'm not an implementer. I haven't. I haven't done this, but I. I do believe this is a more, um, a less complicated technology, especially when you run it on on simple hardware, uh, compared to say lattice crypto or or ISOGD based crypto. Um, this is maybe a stretch, but I'm wondering. A lot of uh, AKEs nowadays they require key compromise, like uh, protection against key compromise impersonation and I feel from my intuition that it's not possible with symmetric encryption um, is your protocols are they did you consider those um, attacks 
like key compromise or that if your uh, key gets compromised that um, somebody else cannot impersonate um, other parties towards you you get what I mean I get what you mean I don't have an answer okay. uh, I, I my intuition is if you have the if you steal both the the like the key a b like the master key and and the mac key that that were that is yeah, my yeah, intuition the same, right? like, yeah, yeah okay. but i'm not i would have to look at it so. okay thank you thanks i actually had a similar question right at, at the beginning you started with what if there is key comp compromise but uh, uh but now you introduced a new mac key no no but so no no but those are different things so um if there is key compromise, can you uh, can you impersonate someone? That's that's a, that's a question. When we talk about forward secrecy, uh, that's something we do solve. So say that I steal a device and I'm able to extract um, like key A B and 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 the Mac key. Uh, that's I mean from now on, it's done. But that won't help you with all previous conversations. You cannot reconstruct even if you've captured this data to to in the hopes of decrypting it. You cannot because the key material does not exist anymore. So that I st that I stand by. <laughs> we solved oh, course, we solved yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, let's thank uh, Bordeaux Cook again. Thank you. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation, so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.